My name is Ed Snyder. I'm the database administrator at Jive Software, which has me working with Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, and MySQL, and I've uh, put my relative enjoyment of each engine um, according to font size. If you need to reach me, you can hit me at Ednor, that's Ed in Oregon. Uh, you get rid LinkedIn that way. Think Google Plus, Ingress, if you play Ingress. And if you're visiting from 1993, you can still email me at edsnyder at jivesoftware.com. Good luck spelling the name. So, we're going to talk about replication. And replication is an awesome solution for databases. But there are literally, in Postgres replication alone, off the top of my head, I can come up with 10 different solutions and projects for replicating databases. If I go and look it up, there's 15 to 20. Some of them are active projects, some of them are stale projects, but there's still a lot of different choices when you're coming to figure out what kind of replication you, what kind of replication you want. And that all comes down to what are you trying to do? Um, what are you trying to fix? Are you trying to read scale? Are you working on high availability? Are you working on just um, you need another reporting server? There's a lot of different reasons and certainly replication is not the first thing that should pop up in your head when somebody presents you with a database problem. Um, once you get to the point of figuring out what kind of replication that you want, then you have to spend a lot of time configuring it. You have to configure each server individually, your masters and your slaves typically. You have to be prepared to reconfigure because things are going to break and things are going to become unsynchronized and you're going to have to figure out when that happens. You're also going to figure out what to do when it happens. And depending on what replication choices you've picked, the ease in fixing broken replication can go from trivial to impossible. So it's very important that you only choose the replication technology that you absolutely need. The other thing that sucks about replication is that it is so easy to describe to someone, to a layperson or someone on the business team. And so you'll have your engineering programming manager explaining replication to the business team. And they're like, oh yeah, we just take a copy of the database, we make a copy somewhere else. And as this database changes, we push everything over. The business team comes up with a vision of replication. Basically, you have one database that things replicate magically. And the one thing as a DBA that becomes almost offensive when you start hearing it is let's just replicate the database. Hey, Ed, good morning. We have a problem. I actually heard this once. Patriot Act doesn't want us to keep data in the United States anymore. So we just need you to replicate that data to Canada. Sing that thing about it. There's two problems with that statement. One, that it's still going to start in the United States. <laughs> so the Patriot Act isn't really gonna help you there. Second, it is just, I can't say, oh, hey, you piece of data that shouldn't be in the United States, you go to Canada, stay away from the United States. It just doesn't work like that. Replication is way more complicated than the cool word that it is. And that when a salesperson is like, oh, we could just replicate that to Europe. Don't worry about data privacy, it's all taken care of. Heard it happen. As technical people, when you think of replication, think of it like the movies. This is what happens when you have replication. I thought this Star Wars one was the most awesome because everybody's the same except this one stormtrooper in the middle who's looking a different way. Nobody knows why, but he's the one that's breaking replication. Terminators, replicated. Cylons, replicated. If I have Star Trek fans here, thought of you guys too. Thought about the Borg. Borg is really more of a Beowulf cluster. Replication, if you have Borgs replicating, your replication's already broken, you need to start over from scratch. Uh, obligatory Chuck Norris because he wrote the ANSI SQL standard, invented replication, it's mature, versatile, powerful, you cannot push it, it will ruin you if you try and cross it. If you try and use it for something that it's not intended for, your replication will become corrupt and you should just look for another job. And he invented replication, but you really have to be careful when you decide on using replication as a technology or solution in databases. So getting into a little meat, um, most important slide, it's not a backup, should always make backups. My entire career as a DBA, I'm still a DBA today because I made backups. Replication has never put me in a position where I could lose my job. Not having backups always puts you in that position. Thankfully, I've always, like, first thing I do as a DBA is make sure I have good backups. I save my ass every single time. Replication, not so much. People forget 
replication breaks, you explain that to them ahead of time, and so people will forget when replication breaks as long as you can go and fix it again. Backups, 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 most important thing about being a DBA in my opinion. Why do we replicate? So, now we're gonna get into the meat of it. We have to figure out what is the reason we're replicating for. Put zombies in here because I'm thinking if zombies take over the data center, replication may be a solution that'll fix that. Uh, typically, my favorite reason for replicating anything is for disaster recovery. I like to have both a near line and a far line sort of solution. So if I have a server locally that dies, I have another server right nearby with pretty much the same information that I can use to bring availability back to the systems. If zombies take over my data center, I like to have another data center where in several hours I can get a copy of my data and if it's replicated then it'll be down to the transaction level so I can get things started up and rebuild a new data center that's zombie free. Scaling is another great thing. Um, if you're running into issues where people are trying to do uh, cross applies and select stars from your tables that are running transactional processes against a normal application. Sometimes you can replicate off an instance and let them beat the hell out of it while it doesn't affect your business users. That's also uh, something I've used a lot in, uh, in, in replication solutions. So that does add into performance depending on how you supplement it with other solutions and uh, also foreign data stores. So if you want to replicate out to MongoDB or to R or Redis, you can do all that sort of stuff now. And there's a lot of good potential for um, bringing in comparisons to unstructured data, doing heavier analytics, and doing some of the stuff that Postgres isn't great at doing by itself. So then we go, whoops, then we go into the flavors, because there's so many different levels of replication. So. Usually as a DBA, if I'm thinking about replication, if I can get away with the top level and make someone else do it for me, then that's the best way to go. Then I don't have to worry about it. If it breaks, I've got someone else to yell at. If you have a SAN replicating from data center to data center, you have a copy of all the data on that SAN. That's a great way to replicate because you're replicating everything. You're guaranteed by the SAN companies that your data is in both places at the same time typically replicates transactionally, and once you get it set up, it's not that bad. If you're already working with the challenges of dealing with a SAN as a database administrator, then utilizing the DR and uh, replication sort of things, it's a great way to go. Uh, furthermore, if you're using, if you're in a heavy virtualized environment, vMotion, HA, things like that, you can do VMDK replication that is just about as good, and Postgres is very robust in that it'll come up as a replicated VMDK, go into crash recovery very quick, and you'll be back to normal. That can be a great solution for smaller systems, for systems where you're not, you don't have too many virtual machines, but you have a manageable amount, and you want to have them be replicated granularly. DRBD is a is a uh, disk level block replication solution. Um, there's actually a great white paper on high availability and DRBD replication for Postgres that I'm going to reference later. But uh, essentially that makes sure that uh, your source site and your remote site match up on a, um, I believe it does a hash match, and then it does a comparison of the two, figures out when it needs to synchronize blocks, sends the blocks over, and you can actually restore the blocks in a way that you can sort of snapshot your remote site, activate the blocks, allow the synchronization to continue while you do your tests for your you know, DR tests, things like that. So there's um, some interesting advantages in the DRVD and working at that level. The next level would be at the cluster level for Postgres. So I need to copy everything in my Postgres instance over from one instance to another. It's very nice when you have a handful of Postgres instances and that's all you have to worry about. If you have hundreds or thousands of instances, then you should probably look up at a higher level of replication. Because if you're looking at a thousand instances and you're replicating a thousand instances, when something really bad happens, you may have to resync a thousand instances. And that doesn't become trivial because you're doing them pretty much one at a time. And then object level, which is, seems to be the favorite solution in engineering departments, but it's also object level. So if you have a thousand tables in your database and you have a thousand databases, then you're replicating each one of those things individually. Typically it's done, um, it's a typically a trigger-based method, but I'm going to get a little deeper into that when I talk about the object-based uh, different kinds of 
replication. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of solutions that I've played around with um, that I think are worth looking into. There's dozens, so I obviously don't have time to go through each one. But um, there's a few that offer just a ton of options and features that are pretty much cover every type of solution you'd be looking for in replication. PG Pool is by far the most comprehensive solution out there for Postgres. It's like, it is like getting the deluxe boat with the helicopter and you can remote control the helicopter from the boat, but you have to know how to fly a helicopter and drive a boat at the same time. It is really complicated to set up. There's so many, it's, it's like, um, it's a web-based GUI and it'll say everything's replicating fine or it's not. And then there's, there's a configuration page that's just massive. And it's because it's so flexible and so powerful that you can have it replicate for you or you can have it watch Postgres replication. You can have it load balance. You can have it pool. You can have it um, take max connections that would be rejected by Postgres and say, hold on a sec, we'll hold those for you and then queue them up and process them. So there's just a ton of different features. Not all of them are replication features, but if you're looking for a lot of different things, depending on what kind of solution you need to bring to your organization, PG Tool may be good if you can take the time to research it test it and configure it. Uh, it, does, uh, it does a lot of things and uh, from a diagram perspective, it's very simple. Basically, you can have Postgres replicate itself. You have PG Pool watch it, your clients come in and it'll do a few different things. One, it'll say, oh, have you failed over? It actually looks at a uh, trigger file in the master, but it doesn't see it. It'll start sending all the traffic to the, to the subscriber. It also has functionality in to resync the master. So that's another cool feature. Uh, we'll also read, it'll read scale if you want it to. So if we have a good master and we have a good subscriber, it will send select <laughs> over to the subscriber to reduce select load on the primary. So there's a lot of ways you can configure it, but you know, once you start digging that hole for yourself, then you can have a pretty big hole. So just be careful of that sort of thing. The other way is you can have PG Pool actually replicate for you where it looks at the statement coming in and it's like, is it a select or an insert or an update? And if it's an update, it sends it off to every server. If it's a delete, it sends it off to every server. There's some consequences potentially in that. Uh, one is that, uh, one is in functions. If you have a uh, function, you have to make sure that if it's a function that does something to your data, that it is being propagated to both. And in that same situation, if you have a uh, transaction that's full of updates and selects and inserts, then you may be in a situation where you do have to get the selects to replicate to both servers when you want things to be synchronized. So you have to be very careful when considering that as a solution. The other big gotcha in PG pool is that uh, PG terminate backends will trigger a failover. So that is like a killer for me because I, you know, if I see an idle in transaction or something, they don't come up a lot, but enough so that I wouldn't want to fail over every time I had to do it. So that's one thing you have to remember about PG pool is that uh, terminate backend doesn't work. Well, it works, but almost too well in this case. And uh, so that's, those are probably the biggest things. The complexity of configuration is really the, what makes PG pool kind of tough. Um, and then you also have to keep in mind that if you're in a scenario where you're already needing to read scale, you have to have adequate resources on your pool, which kind of works as a proxy to make sure it can manage all the traffic that's coming in. Our drip global replication is by far the most detailed way to replicate databases. You can replicate any tables you want, all the tables, some of the tables, none of the tables. In some things there's some, I don't think any of the systems I listed here, but there are ways to filter the data that is actually replicated. And um, so that has great features for a couple of purposes. One is if you're replicating a ton of data, if you can get a copy of that data over there and then you just have to do the delta and you're just sending over, you know, if it's a large database but it doesn't get updated a lot, then, you know, a trigger-based replication might not be so bad. Um, another thing is the... Uh, you take the inverse of like the Patriot Act concept. I have a bunch of data, I have a data center in Canada and there's certain things that can't be replicated in the United States. I can say, okay, all my, you know, anything in the United States section, I'll put it in this schema or I'll put it in this set of tables. Or it's probably the worst idea for a design of a database now I'm thinking through, but uh, anyway, there's, 
ways you can prohibit certain things from being replicated. So you can find a lot of advantages that way. Another way I've used it is I'll replicate system and configuration and environment sort of things that are in a database, but then the actual data will be local to the vicinity where it's work, where it's operating. So there's sort of like a, uh, there's a central set of system tables and things like that, but then the data that is collected from a geographically lo close locations just stays on the same database. And that way you can have your isolation across countries and continents and things like that. Um, Bucardo will replicate in and out of Mongo, Redis. Um, there's also another project called uh, Postgres R that I think uses R to replicate, but you can also replicate into R. And those are great ways to either experiment with unstructured data databases or to find ways to um, run analytics, uh, what really anything you would want to do in a big data application. You can start playing around with just by replicating out. Another thing that I like about um, trigger based replication uh, is there's no limitation to versions. So in Bucardo, one thing I've done is if I have a big system and I need to go from Postgres 8.3 to 9.1, I can configure Bucardo to transfer everything and it'll basically sync everything up, start pushing everything over, and then I can flip it over and I'm running everything on 9.1. So um, that is a that's what I mean by replicating across major versions, is you can replicate up versions, um, and it's usually a very effective way to reduce downtime when you need to upgrade systems, but you're going to new hardware and new versions and that sort of thing. Um, Bucardo also handles master-master configuration, which means I can have two master databases that are collecting data, communicating with each other, and transferring that data back. What could possibly go wrong there? Um, failures. Um, failures are the worst for this because when you get down to the table level of replication, you when, when you have a failure and things go out of sync, then you're actually having to write queries to compare the two tables. There are actually a lot of tools for database um, compares and table diffs and things like that that you can use, but it still becomes a very granular pain in the ass to actually fix it. And a lot of the times, and it's usually the biggest databases, you just have to start over and say, okay, we're gonna replicate from scratch. And then, you know, you're transferring your terabyte database over and get everything synced up again. And that could take a week. So that's, you know, the, the downside of replication is that a lot of times it fails on your biggest databases and getting it set up again is, is gonna take as much data as you have to push from data center to data center. So that's really the biggest challenge with uh, with dealing with replication is fixing it once it breaks. Because once it works, it gets quiet, and it runs nice, totally forget about it, and then three months later, it's, oh my god, database died, you didn't even know what happened, and, uh, and then you're trying to transfer 300 gigs across the uh, you know, 10 meg pipe. So to talk a little bit more about um, master-master replication, you have two masters, they can talk to clients, they transfer information back and forth. Um, Picardo also uh, allows for multiple subscribers. So if I want to have um, two or three or four systems that I'm replicating to, you can absolutely do that. I can have subscribers going from both of my masters. So <laughs> when you go into a um, when you go into a lack of sync issue here, I guess the good news is that you have a lot of copies that you can compare against each other, and the bad news is that you have a lot of copies that could potentially be different from each other and that you have to figure out what the right data set is. So, as long as you proceed with caution, it's not too bad, but uh, once you get, you have a database that's got thousands of tables and you're moving a lot of inserts and you're expecting to replicate a lot of things, since this works on a trigger by trigger basis, it's like, oh, there's an insert, it sends it over, it incurs an overhead, and it is potentially something that can fail in a way that the higher level replication doesn't really have as much of a risk of. My favorite type of replication, which is why I got the laser equipped dinosaurs, because it works like that. Streaming replication came out with Postgres 9.1. It is so easy to set up. You can set up payout standbys. You can have cold standbys that are inaccessible. You can have you know read-only servers. You have to replicate the entire cluster over. So 
if it's something where you've got 25 databases on a cluster and you only want to replicate one, this isn't the solution, unless they're all tiny little databases and you just want to have extra redundancy. Um, and the other thing, and this kind of goes back to replication not being equal to backups, is that if somebody runs a, you know, update without aware or something on your primary, all of that's going to get streamed over to your secondary and it's very fast. So it's not like, uh, <laughs> typically not one of those situations where you can uh, say, oh, stop that replication and, uh, you know, save, save the table. If you screw up a table with a bad query or something like that, it will be streamed very quickly. Monitoring is a little bit lacking right now in Postgres streaming replication. There is a um, there are system queries for it, but since it only did come out in 9.1, it's still not at its full maturity. There's a uh, project called uh, PG Rep, which is a monitoring and management tool for streaming replication. And that's a relatively new project, but that looks like it's going to be a solution that they'll really stick and basically washes washes the servers and fails over if necessary. And then with Postgres 9.2, which is our uh, latest stable release, uh, we have cascading replication. So I can replicate down as many servers if I want. I can have my subscriber replicate to another subscriber. I um, have a couple scenarios now where typically I'll run a uh, replicated nearline server, and then I'll have that cascading replicate out to my DR site. So I've alleviated any sort of I'm replicating one thing across the land, which is not really putting a big load on my primary server. And then if something gets bottlenecked or anything between my DR site and my main site, that's going to affect my secondary server, uh, really not the first server. Uh, I've had lots of situations where uh, it does. there are write-ahead log requirements for it. So you do have to be cognizant of how many walls you keep available because um, if transaction starts queuing and you go past the number of walls you have available, then replication breaks and you have to kind of start all over from scratch. But um, most of the time, if you have enough walls, you can have a full crash, start over, start right back up, replication picks back up, and it's very nice. They did a really good job with it. Um, and this gives you really a ton of options too. You can have a master, you can um, have synchronous replication in 9.2, which means that um, before committing the transaction on the primary, I'm waiting for confirmation that the secondary said this is committed on my side. So you have basically a fully atomic environment um, and, and consistent environment on all your transactions. But it does incur an overhead because it does have to sit there and wait, so you could easily queue up your primary waiting on stuff to come back from the subscriber, but in some cases it's absolutely vital. Um, asynchronous, you can go out and you can stream out cascading to asynchronously to as many servers as you want. So you can really um, build up uh, redundancy, potentially availability, and have copies of your database around that are very consistent. because. There's really not a way to affect the secondary databases in any of this environment. So they're always going to be consistent with your first databases unless replication broke on them and then they're just going to be stale. So it is uh, the easiest and fastest way to set up replication for Postgres by far. Um, reliability, I would say it's greater than any of the other ones, strictly because there isn't all the administrative overhead and complexity of having to pick and choose between which, you know, which tables am I going to replicate or which, you know, which ones am I not going to replicate? Uh, do I have primary keys on all of them? That was something I forgot to mention on uh, trigger-based replication is that your tables need primary keys or else it'll just have to copy the entire table over because it really doesn't understand the difference of deltas if it doesn't have a key to work against. Um, but we have primary keys on all of our tables nowadays anyway, right? So uh, <laughs> um, this is really like if, if you can figure out a way to use streaming replication as a solution. Like, that is absolutely what I would, would recommend. And it's just getting better. In, um, in 9.3, there's a few things going on. Streaming only remastering, this concept where I can have a cascading set of replicated servers. If my master goes down and I activate one of my subscribers, then all of the subscribers below that will automatically pick up as, you know, so the the first, the first new subscriber would become the main subscriber and the secondary and third, and it is um, 
led to uh, faster failover times where uh, they're boasting that uh, potential of five nines of availability in Postgres with the speed of the failover in the replicated scenario. This was, he said, maybe um, that you would be able to stream between Postgres instances that are running on different operating systems. I don't know if that's going from like Linux to Windows, which I'm guessing is what they mean. They really didn't have any documentation there. Just said OS independent streaming. This was my favorite. Um, this, if, if streaming replication couldn't be any easier, this is totally what made it easier. Um, and I'm gonna actually show you my Postgres instance here. Okay. So right here I have one instance of Postgres running. I've got nothing but system databases on it. And I should have just typed it, but oh, there it is. Okay. So this command here, pgbapes backup, my user, you know, uh, Slipping a little on my uh, security from a local machine. The dash capital R and the dash t capital, capital D. Basically what this is going to do is it's going to take a copy from my primary instance, make a copy of it, put it in the directory of my choice, make a recovery file, and then all I have to do is start up the database and I'm replicating. So we'll do it actually. And uh, this you could do. Now one thing with streaming replication is that you have to set up your PGHBA files to allow for replication between servers. Well, once you have that set up, then this is just as easy to do across two servers or three servers or anything. What was so cool about it for me was uh, basically run that. So easy, even a DBA could do it. And um, so now if I go and look in my directory, I'll have a new data2 directory. And that's got everything that was in my data1 directory. A complete copy, including my customizations. So. Um, what I'll need to do here is because this is going to be a um, full copy. I will change my port. And then If I could only type. Looks like there's something wrong with your title bar there. Wait, what? Oh. <laughs> Oh, wait, I forgot. Oh, what, no, what was that? Was that a joke? I, <laughs> did I put something funny on here? Oh, I just was looking at the icons and looked suspiciously not at the source. So, oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, you know what? Because, so, and also I happen to be running on, so I'm very conflicted. This is, it looks like a Mac, but it's running Windows. And if you're running Windows, the only thing you can do for virtualization is VirtualBox. So it's one of those, because I'm, I'm not a Hyper-V fan or anything like that. And believe me, I'm getting away from it with Windows 8. But anyway, um, yes, thank you. Um, so anyway, look here. And um, <laughs> so... So in two commands, basically, with a little prep work on my part, I started a replication. And if I want to, uh, and then log on to my new instance, <coughs> it's already replicated me over. So that's um, basically, I just lit up another instance on another port. But I could go, if I were feeling so daring and I wanted to, start up, um, I'm like, you know, uh, two instances isn't enough for me. So now I want to add my streaming replication to, uh, I want to cascade it down from my subscriber to another directory, makes that, and I can go in here. Put him on for
And so now I've got three instances of Postgres running. What did I make that? Oh, good, I did remember. And there I am. So I've just uh, set up in, in, in like three, way faster than I was expecting to in the time I yeah, did practice this demo. <laughs> um, I set up uh, two, two instances of replication that are cascading down from each other. So I can promise you that if you try to do that with any other replication solution, you'll, I will, I'll beat you a thousand times. I'll have a thousand cascading instances done by the time you set up a single Bocardo replication instance or Sloney or anything. And I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying that they're, they're very complex. You have to really think about what you're doing and test heavily to make sure that it meets all of your use cases because when trigger-based replication goes bad, it's just a nightmare. Um, and we have stuff like this to look forward to in um, 9.3 and it's just gonna make things easier and easier. And they're having so much success with this sort of replication, I think they're really just gonna expand on it as we go forward. We're gonna be looking at more built-in, um, you know, enterprise-level replication features available in Postgres. So it just doesn't, and uh, you know, I can't really see them adding things like trigger-based or oracle-based replication to the internal product. But if they keep building on this, then this, in most cases, you can find a way to implement this as a solution and be as good or better than any of the other solutions. Good question. Mm -hmm. So since it, it, it's so there's a couple of things with streaming. It, it is kind of independent because in streaming replication, it's really just reading the walls and and kind of replaying it on on the new server. So you don't have the same sort of overhead. There is some overhead, um, but then. The, the trade-off being that you don't have to individually configure each thing and it's and as you add tables to like your instance based replication you do add an amount of overhead because you know it's more things washing to have to trigger and fire on most DBAs will you know they're like stay away from triggers forever but that's what a lot of you know article based replication is, is based on um, it's not bad it's just a uh, I would say if you're if you're in a high throughput or large data sort of scenario you want to try and avoid um, any sort of granular replication. You know, have them do it at the SAN or the VMDK if you're running virtually, or set up streaming because it really is that easy. And so, even in 9.2, PG-based backup does exist. The only thing it is missing is the dash R. So you have to make your own recovery comp file, but that's relatively trivial. Um, if you're really struggling with it. Get 9.3 beta, have it make one for you, and then just copy it. It's it's really really easy. Um, so uh, really, what I could um, there's there's really a billion choices, uh, and that's kind of the the crux of the whole thing is that you have to when someone comes over your desk, you're like, hey, can we replicate? Natural solution providers are like, yes, of course we can replicate, and then they're like, okay, I'm gonna sign the contract right now, and you don't know what you signed up for. You have to just say. No, <laughs> no, we can't replicate unless you tell me what you, what do you need. You have to just stop them with that question and come back and say, what are you trying to solve before I'm going to answer whether we can replicate or not. And if you get to that point, then you're going to determine, you're going to be able to determine exactly what it is, is the perfect solution for your system. Um, I, as I was... Uh, getting caught up in 9.3 and stuff, I had a chance to check out Sean Thomas's Postgres Open, um, Google this guy, and um, look for this high availability with Postgres and Pacemaker. That is using uh, DRBD technology, and uh, basically he set up a block level disk replication system um, that is failure aware, and, uh, and it is uh, it arguably as robust as streaming replication. It's not as easy to set up but it does have advantages that you don't have in streaming replication. The biggest one being that in DRBD, you can, um, it's sort of like a snapshot where you can continue replicating between your source and your destination and sort of carve off a snapshot. And that way you can do your DR tests and things like that without having to set up resynchronization all over again. Um, whereas in most cases, if you have to run PG-based backup, that's not really a big deal. 
unless it's a 500 gig database, and then it's going to take a little while. So keep that sort of sand level replication, very mature now. Every sand vendor has it. If you're a DBA and you're being forced to use a sand, then make sure you're getting all the advantages of what a sand is because you're taking performance hits. You're taking, you have to share the storage. You're never quite sure how many IOPS you're going to get anymore because everything's in a big aggregate and carved out. So, okay, you're going to make me use a sand because it's very administratively easy. Then let's get all the good features that I need to make sure that I have a copy of my database somewhere else. And then it becomes actually a great, a great thing to have in your organization. Much easier to work with than dealing with like thousands and thousands of direct access disks, but there's performance price to pay. BMDK is great. Continuance actually has a project. Um, they're more of a commercial proje project, and uh, their latest version is very non postgres -y. Like they talk pretty much all about Oracle and MySQL, but if you dig deep in the documentation, it actually does support Postgres replication as well. Um, Enterprise DB has the XDB replicator, which is uh, kind of like a, a grid, a, sort of an application grid. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of things available. PG Comparator is another one that does sort of a hash match between the two tables and figures out a diff and replicates that way. It was um, very complex. So just with, like with all open source projects, like you have to look at the maturity. Um, the participation, the activity, and that sort of thing. And these are all actually relatively um, popular and active right now. There's a couple other ones that have sort of fallen along the wayside. Um, Daffodil Replicator was one. There was one called PG Replicator. And I wouldn't really recommend those because it looks like there's not going to be any more development on them. Though I, I could totally be wrong too. So, um, really, um, what it all comes down to in the end is choosing wisely. And um, it's like, st stop the person that's telling you what you need, ask them what they're looking for in a solution, and then you figure out for them how, if replication is the answer for, for what the problem that they're, they're, they're bringing to you, or if there's an, a much better solution along the way. And most of the time, as a, um, if you're working with, as a DBA or anything like that, Definitely test out replication. Try out streaming replication. It is such an easy way to get redundancy, availability, and, um, and just an extra copy of your data somewhere so you have it to be safe, you can sleep better, and, um, and it, it is so easy to set up that you'll find that you'll use it along all of your Postgres instances just to be on the safe side. Um, and that's all I have. Any questions? Yes? I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about from the user perspective, what, what you do once you actually Use a cooler distributed query between them and how that might um, anybody have complications with you know, the slay and locking the master? Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if you write something to the master and there's a delay and you try to get it back to the slay and it's not there yet? Sure. So, so what, what do you do next? What do I do? <laughs> so, do, that's a great question. So, when things go bad, what what is what is the approach? Not necessarily go bad. I mean, there's always going to be. Sure. And if you're replicating table A to table, you know, A and that's a database. Mm-hmm. Uh so it, so in a lot of cases, um, that really depends on your solution as well, right? So if you're working with a trigger based data uh, trigger based replication, then that is gonna can, that will ultimately conflict with concurrency operations that you have in the system. So, and that's, it, you, you can suspend replication, and there's also ways that you can suspend it in a way that it queues. Um, a lot of the um, trigger-based replication solutions have, like, what's the concept of a distributed database, so it's sort of like a, a, a middleman between the source and the subscriber, and it will queue the changes, and if there are delays, um, because of network issues, because of concurrency issues, or something like that, then it can it can queue things up. But that has you know that has limitations up to what you put your replication database on, and so um, it's it, it's. Well, I would say streaming replication. You don't really have to like pine over locking so much. Uh, for synchronous replication. Or for asynchronous replication. You have to decide whether you're going to kill off or you're going to slay if something's not going to queue up too far. Because you might run out of wall costs, right? 
Um, let's see. Okay, so you're saying like, let's say I'm locking up both of my servers with, with queries, or? So, uh, theoretical example, I lock something in the slave. Okay. And I write, you know, 500 gigs of wall files on uh, this slave. Ah, okay. Um, so the only, the only scenario I can think of where that would come up is being a master-master scenario, because you can't really, Postgres can't really lock a select um, because of MVCC, so I would expect that if you ran like, a, there's, okay, thinking this through now. If you run, let's say you run a gross query on your subscriber, and it's like, you know, it's cross joining against 100 tables, and so it's inducing a load on, on the slave, and um, it's also potentially locking tables, then then it falls on your right ahead logs and how many of them you're keeping um, for your replication. So in Postgres, you, are you familiar with the right ahead logs? There's uh, typically 16 meg files, and so we're writing all the changes to those logs. Um, so for a very busy replicated system, I typically have, say, um, my max, my keep well files would be like 96. So I would have to have a lot of locking for a long amount of time on my subscriber before I actually lost synchronization. But once those locks were leaved on the subscriber side, then all the walls would start replaying back over. And I mean, they're, so asynchronously, um, True, and that, well, and that's why monitoring is so important. I, like, because you look at PG stat replication and you can actually see down to the wall level where, what state you're in. So if you're monitoring, if you're monitoring the latency between your databases, then you can, then that's actually something that you should monitor for um, when you're setting up replication is uh, too much latency or uh, there's, there's a couple of different ways you can approach that. Um, beyond uh, the monitoring aspect, is there, are, are there tools or methodologies that will help the client actually query intelligently? Like, <laughs> you can alert so uh, that's a tough question. Like, so a lot of times when you have a scenario where you're working with a primary and subscriber and you're using a subscriber for, uh, in, you know, ad hoc query database or something like that, they could, uh, you know, write a ridiculous query against the system. You have to, like, then it comes down to user issues. Like, there's not really anything... I've run into this a lot of times where, you know, everybody wants to have, like, get a special view of the data um, out of a query they've written themselves. And it's, it's and, and then, you know, somebody sees that and they're like, I didn't even know you could see that output that way. And then somebody else sees it. And then you have this giant, you know, join across 20 tables that they're running on the read-only server and locks everything up. It's like, but... Those those are users. Like that's like, <laughs> is, uh, I'm, uh, they're, if if users wrote good queries all the time, we wouldn't have jobs, right? That's like kind of the, the, the part of it is that. Queries that are just as complex, and you don't anticipate the complexity. Automation problems are generally easier to solve than complex queries. That's true. I mean, like, so if you have an application, like, you really have to test an application against that. You know, if you're you have to look at the application, you have to look at how you designed it, and then you have to look at how it's architected. And if replication is an afterthought, then there's a lot of different things like, like, that you're talking about where it might not work. If you're thinking about it ahead of time, and you're like, I know I'm going to have users, I know they're going to want to run ridiculous queries and things like that, and you put that server at the end of the line, and if, let's say you're cascading or something like that, then like, if it goes latent, that's the user's fault because he's running a horrible query. And then we have monitoring that can alert us that our replication's gone stale, but there's nothing we can do about it until we kill that, kill that user or, um, or, or the query, rather, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and move along. But uh, like, that's, one of the, that's one of the sucky things about replication is that you, you, know, you do have to consider the same concurrency models of you know, any asset database you have to take that all into consideration if you're running synchronously, asynchronously, where in a cascading tree you're letting users run, you know, gross queries from, and, and all that sort of stuff. Am I answering your question? Um, kind of. Okay. Killing a query because it's misbehaving doesn't actually address the underlying issue, which is that if you have an application that has a user saying that application that's not designed for this environment, sure. which I would imagine is one of the more difficult situations. Mm -hmm. 
vacancies there. Sure. Um, you know, I, I was sort of hoping that, you know, without rewriting that tool, there were things like, uh, you know, like it feed you down through this one another to see that a database is falling behind and drop out, you know, bring on other databases and say, track up everything. Hmm. Um, as well as, you know, this, hmm. this transaction has some, um, uh, you know, write backs in it. So I'm going to send that transaction to the master. So the sure. Have to be fully aware of the right, right. So, PG Pool does so like it does have some analysis like that. Like it does, it will do a comparison between databases, and it can decide to evict um, a subscriber if it doesn't fit to your rules. Um, but as far and, and it also there there is a way to configure it so that it will actually um, rebuild a. Um, a, a broken subscriber, which almost would would come up to your solution, but not exactly. And it like, so in, let's take that scenario. It's looking at you know, it's looking at all these processes, and it's doing like a you know, a select counts or whatever it's doing to determine whether the, the um, databases are synchronous. And it sees this one is not synchronous anymore, and it's because somebody's running a ridiculous query against it, and it's not able to catch up, and it breaks it off, and then you know, it continues and. One thing I think that PG Pool will be able to do is, let's say you're um, you have multiple read scale servers. If it sees one that's too busy, it'll send read scale queries to another server as well. So it can it, it sort of does follow a load balancing mechanism in that sense if you configure it to do that. Um, but that's like PG Pool for something like that. The the first thing you said is like you know adding replication to kind of fix an existing problem. Most of the time, like, replication will exacerbate an existing problem after, like, after it shows its dark side, you know, and it's exactly like a scenario that you're talking about where, oh, you know, we rescale everything off, but then we find that it has, you know, um, like, reverse back pressure up to your primary and you end up having the same problem. Um, I've done things where, like, in the terabyte scale and things like that, where you replicate things over and then you break them off and you're like, if you have something where users are regularly running two-hour queries, then you have to make a deal with them. You're like, okay, I'm going to give you six-hour refreshes. You can run your two-hour queries, and you're not going to affect my resources at all. Um, and it's basically you're going to restore a backup every six hours or something like that. I've had to do things like that because like, once you get to a humongous amount of data, and if you have to continue working in an OLTP system and people want to run analytics joins against it, you have to... like. You have to come up with compromises, and that's when you know, and that's when you have to punch the business person in the mouth and say, "No, replication is not the answer." Or, you know, this is like we need to invest in, like we need to invest in fixi fixing the problem, not trying to, you know, cover it up with replication. That's I think that's how I would attack it. But you could look at PG Pool. I mean, it's just that if you did that, it's almost like you, you and you make this awesome thing, and it's very aware, and it, you know, it stop, you know, kicks out subscribers and things like that. Then when it breaks, it's like you're the only person that's going to know how to fix it. It's going to be a bare, you know, it's going to be, you know, eight months after you originally set it up and got it working. So you're not going to have this clear, you're not going to be like, oh, it's that, it's that, because you've forgotten about it. And then it becomes its own, um, you know, additional piece of technology that's not working next to the one that you were trying to fix. So that's yeah, definitely be careful with replication. And I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much. If you have any other questions, you can hit me up. I'll be in the hackers on downstairs, um, and uh, more than happy to answer any questions. So thank you.